Thank you very much, Monica. I'll try to to manage with 15 minutes. So uh, please interrupt if you feel uh, uh, asking a question. That's fine with me. And um, so I'll try to give you a flavor uh, of what I've been doing recently or less recently in, the, in this area of uh, metal-organic frameworks. And you may already know or not, uh, with the intention, with the target of transforming these materials to capture light and do chemical reactions, which they are not deemed to do at first. So my talk would be a mixture of uh, what I've always loved doing is uh, combining experimental approaches, synthesis, characterization, with computational stuff in, in order to have a synergy between experiments and modeling. So MOFs, uh, for those who not, do not know MOFs, they are made of, um, is this pointing? Yes. They are made of uh, inorganic uh, subunits connected with organic linkers. And so, they, they, they determine a, a huge class of materials that emerged nearly 20 years ago. And a subclass of those are porous. You have non-porous structures, but here is a topical uh, structure of five discovered by Yagi a few years ago. And the, the interesting thing is that you can play around, sorry, you can play around with the linker, increasing its size. You can play around with the organic subunits to develop a whole zoo of crystal structures. They have many properties. The most fantastic one is the void volumes. You can absorb chemical species, encapsulate, immobilize uh, catalysts, for example. And you can play with the chemistry of the organic linker. So any organic synthesis chemist will love it, which I'm not. But uh, anyway, you can take advantage of the, the intercrossing between organic chemistry, inorganic solid state chemistry, uh, to make catalysis and new materials. So why apply MOFs for photocatalysis? Exactly for the reason I said, you can functionalize the organic linker by grafting a catalyst. And we have a specialist, Jérôme Canivet, in the audience who knows how to do that very well. And uh, you can play with the organic linker to capture light. And then you can combine the capture of light with chemical reactivity within the same pore through this quite complex functionalization. And it's exactly what I, I want to do and to show you how, what we have done in the last years is to take advantage of porosity, to capture the substrates and to diffuse the reactants, uh, play with the organic linker to functionalize it both synthetically and graft a catalyst and then capture light and do photocatalysis. This is quite a you know, uh, I don't know which side, okay. So I'll show you very quickly <laughs> what we have done in this first area, how we can functionalize a non-functional morph towards photocatalysis. And a second, very short story I'll show you about uh, the structure prediction, structure prediction here, which is my favorite area, completely disconnected from synthesis, but still. So first topic, the tuning of photocatalysis, of MOS for photocatalysis. The inspiration comes from nature, but let's forget nature. It's far too complicated. It's doing, done by photocatalysis with the photosystem one, photosystem two, a membrane, proton a gradient. Let's forget. Uh, however, what we can remember is that MOS can do that. And the first system was published by Webb and Lin a few years ago where the moth does capture light. Where is it? It captures light and transfer the f excited photons, phon uh, photons to the catalyst, which was graphed. And it does perform under illumination, under visible uh, CO2 conversion into formate, which is you know, very topical in the energy transition for generating variable molecules. So yes, indeed, moths are a simple version of uh, what photocatalysis naturally is doing by doing this reduction in one step. So there is hope. And what I like is that MOFs do that in a very simple way. The mechanism is very schematically done. The electron comes on the, uh, on the linker, is excited, 
transfer to the inorganic cluster, and then there is a reduction of the zirconium that can then reduct CO2. So there is a whole <laughs> chain of electron transfer, which we may remind you of the natural photosystem, but it was much, much simpler. So we got interested, at, let's come to the point. We got interested in, at the Collège de France to understand, can we tune and engineer the light capture so that we increase photocatalytic performance? And we got interested in the titanium MOF. You know all that TAO2 is the, one of the best semiconductor for photocatalysis. So this titanium is not a, by chance. There is some reason. This is doing photocatalysis by itself. You, you shed light, and because of the amino group of the linker, you generate formate. If you don't, if you don't have amino groups on the linker, it doesn't capture light, it doesn't photocatalysis. So we were, the, we were wondering why are these amino groups needed? <coughs> so you have a detail here where you see the titanium rings connected through terephthalic acid. If you have terephthalic acid with no amino group, the band gap is in the UV. If you have an amino group, you shift the band gap towards the visible, and then you can do photocatalysis. This is in the visible. So we did some density functional theory calculations to understand why, what's happening here. And what is happening is that actually the amino group introduces a new band in the visible, making it yellow. And this is due to electron transfer from the linker here to the titania. And by putting amino groups here, you introduce intermediate energy levels that reduce the band gap. This is more visible here, where I illustrate quickly the band balance from, driven by the organic, conduction band driven by the titania. And by just putting an amino group here, we'll push the balance band up here so that you reduce the band gap by more than one EV. If you put a second amino group, you can even push it up further, and then you, you, you fall within the visible. So this was really interesting, because this is computation. So I went back, uh, oh, this is a bit more computation, just to show you that adding these substituents, you, we can decrease the band gap, and we can tune it. If we change from methyl off, alcohol, amino, or diamino, we can choose where we want to fall within the uh, band gap absorption. So what my interest is here, I stop here. When I saw those calculations, I thought, why don't we do synthesis of this diamino? That would be nice. And then I went to see Clément Sanchez next door, and we worked together for a while. And he it did, it did the synthesis first of this amino group. So you see the non-aminated version, the aminated 10%, 50%, 100% amino. And we see this nice band coming up in the visible. And then he tried doing the de-amino synthesis. And he managed to do a doping version. And then here we are. We have the monoamino. And here is the new band of the de-amino. And you see that here it's ugly because it's a defect structure. But still, we have an absorption in the visible making this a photocatalyst that works, just shedding light to solar spectrum. So that was really per, uh, a very, very good result. We, we went on uh, testing the photocatalytic performance for this, for CO2. This is bad news. It's not better than it used to be with monoamino. It doesn't make much difference. However, we, we wanted to understand what was going on. So we tested the monoamidated version for benzene alcohol oxidation, not reduction anymore, but oxidation this time. And we got very surprised. So we take zero amino, 10%, 20% amino, up to 100%. This is what is here. You see the percentage of aminated thing. And we eliminate with various wavelengths. And we see that we have a linear regime up to 50% roughly. And afterwards, there is a plateau. Why on earth? Is there a plateau? We would expect that more amino would bring more catalysis. So here was a key question. Why is it behaving like this? And we thought, aha, this may be limited by the chemical mechanism of photoactivation of the titania. 
and this may depend on the crystal structure. So we went back to the crystal structure, and I had a look. How does that occur? Here's the mechanism. The key thing is that we start from titanium 4 plus. We shed light so that electrons from the linker go to the titanium wheel so that, in fact, we generate holes in the linker and one titanium 3 plus for each linker activated. So we end up with a mixed valence titanium 3, 4 plus, meaning that we cannot have a wheel made only of titanium 3 plus. So we are limited due to electrostatic interactions within the titanium structure. That was interesting, and we had to confirm this, because this is an hypothesis. And we confirmed this with ESR, where we show that with tem temperature, the temperature shows, this is a signal of the electron hopping from titanium 3 plus to 4 plus, and with temperature it disappears. This disappears at room temperature, showing that it's an activated process, and that indeed, the cationic pair is indeed of titanium 3 plus 4 plus. So indeed, the limitation that we see in the catalysis comes from this uh, mixed valence state. I think I'm nearly over. <laughs> uh, let me just, you know, uh, how many minutes do I have left? Two? <laughs> Maybe two. Uh, it's very quick. It's very simple. What I love is to use computation is to invent new materials from scratch. Can we predict new structures? I've been working for years in the zeolite area. You may know, zeolites share tetrahedra of silica uh, in 3D space, generating beautiful microbial structure. And they do plenty of things, catalysis adsorption, uh, plenty of nice things because of the hierarchical structure of pores. So my, the idea I had is why not changing that state of thing? Instead of having oxygens and silica, why not having an organic linker here and an inorganic catalyst taking the place to have functional porous structures? And the idea came at the time I was working in Versailles with Anne Dolbeck. She's an expert in uh, polyoxometallates. And she's doing polyoxometallate is a very rich chemistry in catalysis. And the idea was to choose a, no, a polyoxometallate having exactly the same coordination than silica, meaning tetrahedral, and choosing a linker having the same coordination than oxygen by down date. And actually, we, it was really great fun to transform the zeolites in silico in the computer into candidate structures. Just by substituting each and decorating the network, we could end up with very, very open structures. We did that for a tons, uh, dozens of structures. We generated, so let's shift that. We generated plenty of hypothetical structures, including cristobalite, quartz, coesite, or even more open structures like the zeolites, phosphorite, you know, maybe. There are huge structures having heavy numbers of atoms, so the simulation of those were quite demanding. And the idea was to estimate their stability through computation. So I won't go into the detail. That is to calculate the energies through van der Waals, and they have been confirmed through uh, quantum mechanics later. The idea is that all the, all the candidates you see, we find that the cristobalite is the most stable one. And the, the thing I want to finish is that the postdoc who worked on that did the synthesis as well. She, she worked for months trying to find this cristobalite. And at the end, she did. It was just amazing. A few months later, she came out with dark blue crystals. And actually, her synthesis were just next door. She found the cristobalite slightly different, a bit squeezed, because it was interpenetrated with three other networks. So that was stunning because, you know, having predicted something and do it later is one of the most uh, thrilling experience for a computational scientist like me. And then, la cerise sur le gâteau, 
which is not dependent on me, is that these materials had the electrochemical properties that we expected doing hydrogen evolution. I think I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you for your uh, attention and many co-workers not here. Some of them are here, uh, but not specifically on that matter. And uh, if you want to ask questions, or later.